So as our last lesson in this uh, section, we're going to be looking at work and potential energy as they relate to torque in a rotational reference frame. So we'll start off with our linear definition of work based on force and you know how much distance is covered, as well as our equation for relating that distance to a rotational frame of reference. So we'll start off by making both of these, though this one is already differential, we'll start off by making this differential just to make the substitutions easier later on. Oh, I switched up the D right there, that should be R D theta. Okay, so from here we know that the dot product between F and DR can be written as the component of F perpendicular times R. So we get that DW equals F perpendicular times R, or DR rather. But we know that uh, DR can be substituted in. Uh, this is actually a DX because it's linear. So we can substitute in and we know that work equals F perpendicular times r d theta, but we already know that uh, f times r is the torque. So the work ends up being the torque times the infinitesimal change in theta. Or for constant torques, you get that work equals torque times delta theta, which makes sense because work in a non-rotational frame is force times delta x. So once again, our rotational analog follows from the linear equivalent. Moving on now, we're going to look at uh, potential energy and how that relates in a rotational frame of reference. So if you'll recall, total mechanical energy equals kinetic energy plus potential energy. And kinetic energy is uh, can be written Basically, work is the change. Work is the change in kinetic energy based on some sort of outside force or what have you. Therefore, the infinitesimal change in work equals change in kinetic energy. Which, if the total change in energy right here is zero, we know that the kinetic energy equals the negative of the potential energy. So this is negative du. And from here, we already found that uh, this dW is torque times d theta. So substituting that in, we get that torque d theta equals negative du all the way across here. And then all we have to do is recombine the variables to get that torque is the negative change in potential energy with respect to angle, which makes sense. It follows from the same sort of analog as force equals negative du dx. And the last thing we're going to be looking at very briefly is power, which if you'll recall is simply the uh, change in work with respect to time. And because we know that work is tau times d theta, well d theta dt is simply omega. Therefore we know that power equals torque times omega. So here we have, I have all the equations derived uh, summarized here in these boxed equations. Uh, as this is our last video, we're not going to be uh, covering the rest of the equations here. If you want to review the equations from previous videos, you can go back and look at the summaries at the ends of those. Uh, now we're going to be moving on to do a practice problem or two using the concept we've learned in this chapter. So our first practice problem is going to be relatively simple. We'll just look at a wheel with some torque applied and it has some moment of inertia I and some delta T to reach a certain frequency from rest. So basically you're starting from uh, not moving at all, you apply a torque and then it reaches some relative frequency. And what we want to know is what is the torque required to reach that frequency in this given time with everything we know about uh, the wheel itself. So we start off with our simplest known equation which is torque equals I alpha and this is what we're going to be using to solve for the expression for torque. From here though it gets a bit trickier because all that we are uh, given is frequency and uh, we don't have anything relating directly uh, I and A as well as frequency. 
So we have to look at uh, what we what equations we do have. We know that omega equals omega zero plus alpha times t. And because it starts from rest, we know that initially it has uh, no rotational velocity. We also know that omega is two pi over the period or two pi times f because uh, period and frequency are inversely related. So substituting that in, we get that two pi times, two pi times the frequency equals alpha times t. Now from here, we have all our known variables. All we have to do is move this t over and then substitute that in to our known equation for torque to derive the expression torque equals I times alpha, which we can substitute this two pi f over delta t term. And that is the torque required to accelerate it to that frequency in the given time. So as our last practice problem and uh, video in this chapter, we're going to look at this situation where we have a boat being pulled along by this uh, weight over here by gravity, uh, connected via this pulley, which does not have, which is not uh, frictionless and massless, basically. This has some rotational inertia, m2 r squared over two. And acting on this boat is a frictional force proportional to its velocity. So as you increase the velocity, the force resisting it increases as well. And what we want to do is derive an equation for the total acceleration of the system. So we'll start off as we always do by drawing our FBDs. In this case, we'll draw them for the three different objects. So for M1 right here, we have tension number two pulling on that and then negative BV, the frictional force, as well as a normal force or buoyant force from the water and its weight. Uh, acting on this pulley, we'll do, instead of a free body diagram, we'll do a torque diagram. So we have T1 pulling here and T2 pulling here. We have the support force and uh, the weight acting at the axle slash center of mass. And for the third mass, we have, you know, simply its weight pulling this way and the first tension pulling that way. Now all these uh, normal and weight forces for each object cancel out because none of them, oh, except for uh, M3 rather, uh, the first two objects don't accelerate in the y direction at all. So we can just ignore those. Everything's occurring linearly along this rope. So from here, what we do is we sum the forces or sum the torques, depending on uh, what sort of frame of reference we're using. In this case, I'll start with object number one. So the sum of the forces equals its acceleration. And we know that because it's accelerating this way, we'll make T2 positive. So T2 minus BV equals m1 times alpha. Next, we will sum the torques on object number two, which we know equals i times alpha. And we know that it's t1 minus t2 equals uh, m2 r squared over two. And lastly, we're going to sum the forces on object three, which equals its acceleration, and that's simply m3g minus t1 equals m3 over A. Now it should be noted that this alpha term is really just uh, A over R. So if we uh, cancel that out and substitute in an A over R, we can cancel out one R term. From here, all we do is substitute in known values for T2 and T1 based on our force equations. So we know that T1 is uh, M3G minus M3A, and then we subtract T2. So minus M1A uh, plus or minus BV rather. And all that equals uh, M2R over two times A. From here, it's just a matter of algebra, moving all the like terms onto one side and then uh, factoring out the A, the acceleration value and solving for it. So we know that uh, M3G minus BV equals 
m2 r over 2 plus m3 plus m1 all times a or you get your final answer that the acceleration of the system is m3g minus b times v over m2r over 2 that should be a 2 plus m3 plus m1 oh wait no that's that's not right there shouldn't be an r in the answer uh, oh let's see yes in the torques i forgot to add in a uh, multiply by the radial distance and that cancels out this extra r and then when you go through all the extra steps obviously that r cancels out and so you end up with the actual answer is a equals m3g minus bv over m2 over 2 plus m3 plus m1 so that concludes our look into rotation one in the next chapter we'll be continuing our look into rotation specifically with inertia equilibrium and then combining rotation and translation